Hi, and welcome or welcome back to Mallory in the Library. This is going to be our final week of stories. And so um, to honor that, I've just chosen some stories that are my favorite that we haven't shared yet in a theme. And so we're going to start with one called The Hike. And this is by Alison Farrell. It's dedicated to Finn, Bryn, and Morgan, and to young hikers everywhere, with special thanks to Jenny Tilson and Scott Cluse. Yoo-hoo! Almost ready? Just one more cut! Just a few more feathers! And then there's a sunflower and a three sisters garden which is corn, beans, and squash. We are going on a hike! That's Ren, Elle, Hattie, and Bean. And again, you can see all of the things that they see. Maybe if you go on a hike this summer, you'll get to see something like the red fox, or a lupine, or a chipmunk. It's our favorite thing to do! Shook, 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 shook. Fairy ring mushrooms, porcupine quill, Oregon grapes, salmon berries. Hey, wait for me! In the beginning, we run like maniacs. until a ripe patch of thimbleberries slows us down. Elle teaches us how to make leaf baskets. And we have Ren's sketchbook. Leaf basket, Elle's instructions. Find one big leaf with five tips. Poke the stem into opposite um, leaf tip. Tip by tip. Poke the leaf tips with the stem, and then pack with berries. Like this, L? Yep. We may have eaten too many berries. Is that possible? I thought we were saving some for later. Arf. The hikes get steep and the trail narrows. Boo! Ah, Cuddy, how did you get up there so fast? We get lost. Hmm, which way is north? Pretty sure we are not supposed to cross a river yet. Did we go left after the berry patch? Right, I think. Ren, what's another word for blue? Azure? Cerulean? Cobalt? Ren's sketchbook. Patty always finds a route in the bird's eye view of Patty. We're halfway there. In no time, we get back on track. Who made these? They're looking at the footprints. A deer walks past. Bean sneezes. Achoo! Some of these things you can see around Ontario too. Um, like a white-tailed deer, or you can see black moral mushrooms. You might not be able to see this type of spider. But you can see other types of spiders. The deer vanishes so quick. I wonder if it was even there. A light rain comes and goes. The birds are happy. 
We listened to them chirp and chatter in the trees. This is the river we were looking for. Right, Hattie? Yep, Wren's sketchbook. Birds we saw at Whitefish River. Anna's hummingbird, a mountain chickadee, and a mountain bluebird. Hattie gets tired. Elle offers to carry her. We can't hear you. I said 30 miles to the top. Soon, Elle is tired too. Giddy up. We can't do this much longer. Rides over everybody. Brr, it's getting chilly. Why do you think that it's getting colder the higher up the mountain they go? Usually, when you go up higher places, it does tend to get colder. At the top, Wren takes out her flag, Elle reads her poem, and Hattie releases feathers into the wind. We did it. It's just sunset when they're going down the mountain. And look at all the stars and constellations going back home. More notes from Wren's sketchbook. Some things I saw today. A stellar's jay, barred owlets. Hattie says barred owls sound like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Psst, why does she keep asking? No one ever cooks for us. There are dead trees that provide life support, like nurses' logs who help feed younger trees, trees that feed mushrooms, or trees that provide houses for birds. Oh my gosh, there's even more. They saw invasive plants and oysters and a banana slug and the deer. All the fruits and plants too. So I think it's going to be a little chilly for the next couple of weeks. But maybe when it warms up, you can go out and see what you can see. And maybe you'll have a notebook too to write down what you found. Our next story is called This Is Not My Hat by John Clausen. And I love this book. It says, For Will and Justin, again. This hat is not mine. I just stole it. I stole it from a big fish. He was asleep when I did it. And he probably won't wake up for a long time. Hmm. And it, even if he does wake up, he probably won't notice that it's gone. And even if he does notice it's gone, he probably won't know that it's me who took it. And even if he does guess it was me, he won't know where I am going. You may have some idea. But I will tell you where I am going. I'm going where the plants grow big and tall and close together. It is very hard to see in there and nobody will ever find me. There is someone who saw me already, but he said he wouldn't tell anyone which way I went. Hmm. So I'm not worried about that. 
But look what, he's pointing right where he went. I know it's wrong to steal a hat. I know it does not belong to me, but I'm going to keep it. It was too small for him anyways, and it fits me just right. And look, I made it where the plants are big and tall and close together. I knew I was going to make it. Nobody will ever find me. Hmm, he is hard to find. You can see him. He got his hat back. Looks like he did get found after all. Okay. Our next story is The Princess and the Pea by Rachel Isadora. So this one says, once upon a time there was a prince The prince wanted to marry a real princess, so he traveled all over the world in the hopes of finding such a lady. He met many princesses, but it was difficult to tell whether they were real ones. Let's go one. Jumbo, a bari. There was something about each princess that was not quite right. So the prince came home again and was sad. One evening, there was a terrible storm. Suddenly, a knocking was heard at the gate, and the old king ran to open it. There was a princess standing at the gate. She said she was a real princess. Ah, we shall soon find out if she is real, said the queen. So she went into the bedroom where she had laid a pea upon the bedstead. Then she took 20 mattresses and laid them on the pea and put 20 feather beds on top of the mattresses. On this, the princess had to lie all night. The next morning, the princess was asked how she had slept. Oh, very badly, said the princess. I scarcely closed my eyes all night. Heaven only knows what was in the bed, but I was lying on something hard, so that I am black and blue all over. That's horrible, said the king. Now they knew she was a real princess because she had felt the pea right through the 20 mattresses and the 20 feather beds. Nobody but a real princess could be as sensitive as that. So the prince took the princess for his wife. The pea was put in a museum where it may still be seen if no one has stolen it. There, 
That is the true story. And when we saw the other princesses and what they were saying was hello in different languages. Our next story is called In a Jar by Deborah Marcero. It says, for those in my life to whom upon parting it felt too soon to say goodbye. Llewellyn was a collector. He collected things in jars. When he held a jar and peered inside, Llewellyn remembered all the wonderful things he had seen and done. He collected small, ordinary things like buttercups, feathers, and heart-shaped stones. One night, the sunset painted the sky the color of tart cherry syrup. Llewellyn ventured down to the shore with as many jars as he could carry. A little girl named Evelyn was there too. Llewellyn scooped that cherry light into his jars. And when he was done, he gave one to Evelyn. Evelyn took the jar home. And to her surprise, it glowed through the night with the memory of that sunset. From then on, Llewellyn and Evelyn collected things together. They collected things hard to hold like rainbows, the sound of the ocean, and the wind just before snow falls. They collected things you might not think would even fit in a jar. But somehow, they did. They collected the wonders of winter. Looks like there's a lot of things there, like a fox, hot cocoa, a bird, an owl, fireplace, and skiing. And skiing. And skiing. The newness of spring. Looks like they have cherry blossoms and ducks and rain and fox babies and tadpoles and daffodils. And the long days and shadows of summer. Over time, their jars filled the walls of Llewellyn's house. But one day, Evelyn had sad news. Her family was moving to a new town, and too soon, it was time to say goodbye. With Evelyn gone, Llewellyn's heart felt like an empty jar. One night, Llewellyn lay awake. Falling stars glittered against the dark sky. He wondered if Evelyn could see them too. That gave him an idea. Llewellyn tiptoed out into the moonless night and collected a meteor shower in a jar. The next day he prepared a package. When the box arrived and Evelyn opened the jar, the stars in the night sky fell around her. Evelyn knew just what to do. She collected the sounds, the crowds, and the bright lights of her new home. And she sent them all to Llewellyn. And so when the golden leaves of autumn began to fall once again, 
Llewellyn set out to collect a jar full for Evelyn. A little boy named Max was there too, and luckily Llewellyn had brought an extra jar. So sometimes it's nice to make new friends too. Our last story will be A Stone Sat, Sat Still by Brendan Wenzel. A stone sat still with the water, grass, and dirt, and it was as it was where it was in the world. And the stone was dark. And the stone was bright. And the stone was loud. Looks like a seagull is cracking a shell on it. And the stone was quiet. And it sat where it sat, with the water, grass, and dirt, and it was as it was, where it was in the world. And the stone was rough, and the stone was smooth. And the stone was green, red, purple, and blue. And the stone was a pebble. A very big miss. And the stone was a hill. A very small bag. And the stone was a feel, and the stone was a smell. And it sat where it sat, with the water, grass, and dirt, and it was as it was, where it was in the world. And the stone was the wild, and the stone was a home. And the stone was a kitchen, and the stone was a throne. And the stone was a marker, and a map, and a maze. A danger, a haven, a story, and a stage. And the stone was a blink, and the stone was an age. And the stone was an island, and the stone was a wave. See how it's under the water here, and the water's going up and over, making a wave. And the stone was a memory. And the stone was always. Have you ever seen such a place? Where with water, grass, and dirt, a 
us a, a stone sits still in the world. And here it says, for Ophelia and Calista. So I want to use the last few minutes of our time together to say some extra special thank yous to the people who have been very helpful to make Mallory in the library a reality. I'd like to start by thanking Sam, who has been doing our technology and streaming for the last few months. Thank you so much, Sam. And to Sally, who is helping us today uh, get the stream going. I would also like to thank George and Elizabeth and Krista for everything that you have done to support me, picking stories and watching the stream and really helping me out during this time. And I would also like to thank all of you who have watched whether just once or if you've seen videos lots of times. Thank you so much for your support and um, I hope that you learned something. I hope that you enjoyed these stories and I will hopefully see you again someday.